So this paper is actually very simple, where our objective is quite straightforward, and the model we're going to use is fairly standard. And what we're motivated by is a literature that Timo alluded to, which um, measures something called investment-specific technical progress, generally for the United States, and finds that it's an important engine of economic growth. So <clears throat> the way this is, well, so what happens is, however, that actually, well, it's usually found that investment-specific technical progress contributes more than 50% to economic growth in the United States in the post-war period. So what's lacking, however, is a sense of how important this factor of growth might be in other places, or globally for that matter. And so the objective of this paper is to try and get at that, to try and get a sense of how important is investment-specific technical progress around the world. And before, just to make sure we're all on the same page, investment-specific technical progress is basically improvements over time in the efficiency of investment. So over time, the number of capital goods that you get in efficiency units by sacrificing one unit of consumption goes up. Right? It could go down too, of course. Right? That wouldn't be progress. In any case, that's the phenomenon that we're going to be discussing. And it's typically measured using the relative price of capital compared to everything else, consumption and services. And so everything we're going to do is going to be very standard in terms of the literature. It's just that, again, since we're trying to do this for a large set of countries, there's certain issues that we're going to have to deal with in one way or another um, to try and make this happen. This is a graph basically just to motivate our study and why it might be interesting to think about this around the world. On the x-axis is the rate of investment-specific technical progress, annualized. And these are three measures. Uh, I'll explain later why there are three measures. On the um, x-axis is GDP per person, 2009. And as you can see, there's a clear negative relationship here. So there's a well-known paper by Xian Clino, which is arguing that the price of capital is higher in a lot of developing countries, and that this is possibly a factor depressing um, the level of economic activity. What we're seeing here is something about the rate of change of that thing, okay? the rate of change in the relative price of capital. So this is a different phenomenon. So if you think about, if you're coming, thinking about Shanklina, what this is saying is that what they find is a phenomenon that's getting worse over time. That um, capital is getting cheaper only in wealthy countries. And actually, if you look at these numbers, depending on which measure you're looking at, not this one, which um, is really, a, as we'll see later, is really an indicator of composition rather than an indicator of the rate itself. If you look at the other two, for many countries, the rate of investment specific technical progress measured in the usual way is negative. Okay. Time period. Um, most of these data are going to be also for the post-war period, so like 1950 or so, up to 2011, correct. And among other sources, yes. This is a rate of change of the same thing, basically, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's really just motivating. That's not telling us how important those things are, right? The correlation could be there with um, um, ISTC being extremely important everywhere or not important anywhere, right? So this graph doesn't tell us anything but in itself, but it is a motivating factor, of course, if there, if there is this variance, this, if, if this turns out to be a significant variation across countries in the rate of ISTC, then of course that begs the question, well, what's going on here? And so that's something we'll have a little think about too. Yes, sorry. Um, we're still trying to uh, take it apart. So the first thing, again, most of what we're going to be doing is just trying to repeat basically the exercise or something like the exercise in Greenwood, Herkowitz, and Grissel just to try and get an idea of what the numbers are. 
And then we're doing a little thing at the end so far, trying to um, get a sense of um, what might be underlying the differences. So, so we, yes. That's right. We'll, we'll think. We'll, we'll have a we'll have a look at that. We still don't have um, a full answer yet, as um, our discussant will explain. Yes. So, conceptually, it's the rate at which um, the rate of change, the marginal rate of transformation between consumption and capital. So, in a typical model, in a typical growth model. Output can be used for investment or consumption, and a unit of output that's not consumed turns into a unit of capital. In reality, of course, a unit of output might turn into Q units of capital, and that number Q may change over time. So, TN Klein is about the value of Q. We're talking, we don't care about the values, we're talking about how it changes over time. Uh, okay. So I actually told you a lot about what we're going to do. I said there are certain issues that we need to confront if we're going to try and do this for a wider set of countries. Um, one is, um, well, the approach to determining what, how big is the contribution of a given factor of growth is something we have to start. Well, you have to decide that before you even do anything. And we're going to go with general equilibrium growth accounting. So for example, what this means is that Capital deepening induced by a particular factor of growth, such as productivity change or STC, is part of the contribution of productivity change or STC. <coughs> That's consistent with GHK, Greenwood, Hercules, and Grissel. A second issue which hasn't received too much attention is um, the fact that given that ISTC works through the investment function, right? So do all to do with um, the rate at which capital is accumulated compared to output, that means that the capital share in GDP is going to be very important. And that's true in the United States, but the prior of many people might be that that could be particularly a concern in the case of some developing countries that you might think depend heavily on natural resources for income, in which case, rather than measuring the share of um, capital and income as one minus a labor share, you might want to be careful about making sure that resources are taken out too. So it turns out that doesn't matter much, but, in, but when we started, that was something that we were particularly worried about, and that means that the model that we're going to use is not the same as being with Hercules and Grissel because we want to make sure natural resources are there in some way or another. We actually have two models, natural resources. A third issue is the issue of whether or not when you're measuring the price of capital, and therefore also the change in the price of capital, you should be adjusting for quality. And there's um, not really a consensus on that. People who work in this literature um, generally go for, yes, you need to adjust for quality because we see that in computers particularly, but also in other forms of capital, there are um, drastic improvements in quality. And so, when, so we should be using hedonic prices or some other way to try and measure capital, quality, when we're trying to get hold of the efficiency units. In contrast, there is um, the view of Wellen, which is that um, the relative price of capital is the price of capital divided by consumption. So we should be quality adjusting the numerator and the denominator, not just one of them. Right? Um, Actually, Gordon is not to blame for this, but some other people who've worked on this area would argue, well, unmeasured quality changes are a big deal in capital goods. There's no particular reason to think they're important in consumption. But um, again, really, I guess that's something we don't completely know about. And so Wellen argues, well, really, it's not clear that the quality adjusted measure is any better than the official values that do less of an adjustment. What we take away from this is at least we need to think about this. Yes. Yes, in the end, right, so that graph that we looked at before is just motivating. Our paper is not about how these things are related to levels. It's all about accounting for growth. Yeah. So, and the fourth issue, which I'm not going to spend too much time talking about, is mainly a data issue, but there are maybe theoretical implications too, at least you might think so, 
is that a lot of developing economies actually import a lot of their equipment. So all the so maybe they don't import buildings, but uh, <clears throat> they certainly import computers, and uh, I don't know maybe even. In, my father runs a an agro business in Peru, and the four hundred thousand dollar dryer and um, grinder that he uses is not from Peru, because right? we don't have that stuff. If we did, it would probably fall apart. So, um, so since the a lot of these countries may be actually importing their capital goods, um, what does that mean? It means that. Um, one should at least think about whether the typical general equilibrium growth accounting model that's used in this context is appropriate because we need to at least make sure that um, the approach to measurement is robust to allowing for imports of capital. So we have a little um, section of the model where we um, imagine what, might, uh, what things might look like if capital is imported and it also suggests a strategy for trying to measure ISTC, aside from just looking at prices of capital, because it means that we can get maybe a reasonable picture of the composition of capital by looking at imports, maybe a more detailed one than we would get by looking at um, <clears throat> typical statistics about what people are doing in those countries. Those typically don't exist, whereas import and export data are quite detailed. And we're not looking at input-output tables. What we will do at some point, again, is imagine that the quality-adjusted numbers for each particular type of capital good, or rather each particular type of equipment good, specifically, in the United States is the same everywhere. This is going to be one extension, an additional measure. Then if the composition of imported capital is representative, we can just get a weighted average by looking at import data, which is quite detailed. And again, we won't use it as a measure of the rate itself, but the way in which that thing correlates with the other measures that we use is going to be informative about, at least to some extent, what's going on down here. So we find in general that ISTC is not a particularly important contributor to growth in most places. And in fact, in many places, as you saw from the graph, it's going to be a negative, right? If the efficiency of investment is getting worse over time, that's something that's a drag on your economy because it's actually discouraging capital accumulation relative to if that factor weren't there. <clears throat> so we can actually come up with a um, global measure of this by just taking the rate of ISTC in different places and weighting it according to... GDP, and we get, depending on the approach to growth accounting, and you'll see in a minute what I mean by that, I guess what it means is, are we using quality-adjusted measures or not? And um, exactly which model of resource accumulation do we use? Because that matters a little bit, too. We're going to get a contribution to overall growth between 3 and 19%, which is arguably not terribly big. Right. Um, the capital share adjustment isn't particularly important. And then again, we'll chat a little bit about um, why this variation might exist, what kind of factors are there. And we're going to find that partly it seems related to the composition of capital, basically because this measure that I just described, assuming the quality adjustment is the same around the world, is in the United States, and then using the composition of imports to come up with a, um, a measure that, of course, by construction focuses solely on composition and nothing else, right? Composition of capital. Find that that measure is actually quite closely related to the measures using official prices. Related in the sense that it's correlated. It's not related in terms of magnitudes. Since it's not related in terms of magnitudes, that tells you something else is going on in addition. Right? <clears throat> um, some people find the, well, um, Caselli and Wilson created some measures by capital good type of the upstream R&D that's embodied in them um, by measuring how much R&D is devoted towards particular types of capital goods in the countries that primarily make them. We find that that measure is actually very strongly related to across countries to um, the rate of ISTC. So that means that an interpretation of what's going on might be that um, 
countries around the world vary systematically in terms of the amount of upstream R&D that's embodied in the capital goods that they use. And then, of course, and then we find that, well, if you're importing capital goods, then that means that changes in the cost of imports are going to be a factor if there, such, if there are such changes, are going to be a factor affecting the uh, rate of investment statistical progress, where, of course, the technology of investment is no longer a box you have where you shove in consumption and out pops capital goods, right? Now the technology of investment is the system of international trade. So we find that um, there's some relationship between trade costs and the composition-based measure. And we had a quick look at institutions around the world, which, um, based on early literature, including work by me and others, um, you might think might be potentially related to the incentives to use advanced capital, things that might be related to the cost of upgrading, as well as the cost of the goods themselves. We find the financial development intellectual property rights are related. And it's kind of interesting that there's this R&D interpretation of the phenomenon and the fact that intellectual property rights enforcement at least seems to be related. Again, this is a very simple exercise. We're just trying to get a rough idea of what might be going on here. This is what pops out. So the production function is very simple. This is a very standard production function, just capital labor. There's this extra thing, H this extra input, and that's the resource, whatever it is. And there is uh, GZ, a factor of growth, which is simply productivity change that affects the economy overall. <clears throat> this is a capital accumulation function. This is what I was describing to you verbally. Um, it should look standard, except that additions to the capital stock are not just I, foregone output, non-consumed output, but it's I times this term Q, which could change over time by a factor GQ. Of course, if GQ is greater than one, we are gonna call that investment-specific technical progress. Notice I'm always talking about ISTC, where instead of progress, we have change, because we don't know what's gonna pop out yet. <clears throat> what about the resource? As I said, they're gonna be, there's going to be more than one model of the resource, because well, there's more and more way of thinking about resources. There could be exhaustible resources and replenishable resources, and it turns out that each model is going to have slightly different, well, they're going to have different implications for general equilibrium growth, account, growth accounting, whether it's slightly different or very different, that's an imponitive question, right? And so they're essentially going to function as upper and lower bounds on the contribution of ISTC to growth. And of course, we could just imagine a more complicated model where they're both kinds of resource, but um, since we're, it's not obvious how to pin down how much of each kind there is, um, we just use them as bounds, two models, rather than saying, well, we're somewhere in between, and we don't know exactly where. There's not really much point. So this is the exhaustible resource model. It's fairly standard again. So X is the stock of the resource that you have. The stock tomorrow is the current stock minus whatever you used. Now, whatever you use is H, the quantity that actually goes into consumption. But notice it's also multiplied by this term. So just as there's investment-specific technical progress, in principle there could be resource-specific technical progress, which would be a third factor of growth. We're going to allow that, um, at least in principle. It could be interpreted as changes in the efficiency of the resource use. Um, but it could also be interpreted as changes in the efficiency of the process that used to extract the resource as well. There's a presence to this in the literature on um, resources and growth. I already said this. Output has two uses, consumption and investment. And preferences are standard. If you do this, solve the general equilibrium, so, sorry, solve for the um, balanced growth path, you're going to get this as the equilibrium equation that describes growth. So G is the growth factor of output per capita. GZ is neutral technical progress. GH is um, resource specific technical change. 
GEQ is investment specific technical change. And there's the discount factor. It's a bit unusual, isn't it? Or maybe not. Hotel in 1931 tells you that the optimal rate of extraction of an uh, exhaustible resource is related to the discount factor. And so it just shows up here, the growth account, equilibrium growth accounting equation. So that's actually natural. How do we define the contribution now that we know what growth is in equilibrium? Actually, before I do that, the contribution is just what happens to growth if I make GQ go away, if I make it one? That's all the contribution is. That's how it's defined in the related literature anyway. Whoops, sorry. No, there we go. So here specifically is defined as a decrease in growth that I get if I set GQ so equals one. So this is the same equation up there, but with GQ missing. Um, if I rearrange this, you end up with this expression as being um, equivalent. And the reason that's useful is because it shows you that we actually don't need to know what GZ and GH are right? in order to get a measure here. All we need to know is GQ and take it out of whatever we started with. So not to suggest that distinguishing between the two would not be interesting, though as we'll see, the resource shares seem to be so small around the world that it's probably not important anyway at the end of the day. So here's a replenishable resource model. It's a bit different, and the way we're modeling it is, well, resource is basically another kind of capital if it's replenishable. You just keep adding to it, how? By using output, which converts into the resource at some rate Q. So here we have resource-specific technical progress again, but showing up in a different way. So now there are three uses of output. Consumption, investment in the stock of physical capital and investment in the resource. <clears throat> so you get a different equation here. The discount factor is no longer there. And this exponent is a little different, which implies that the contribution is a slightly different expression to what we had before, before this was missing. So to the extent that that's not zero, you're gonna have a different contribution. One's gonna be, this is always gonna be systematically larger in magnitude than the other one, so we have bounds. There we go. And when we started, we were using a different data set where alpha H was actually a lot larger, but the consensus seems to be that there's a new paper that uses a better measure, it turns out, and are much smaller, so the differences are not that great anymore <clears throat> in this version. Now, there is, we're gonna have a third measure of the contribution um, because there is work by Rachel and co-author that um, suggests that if you extend these models to explicitly allow for input-output linkages between um, invest the capital goods producing sector and the consumption goods producing sector, then you may have um, a larger contribution because let's say now ISTC might contribute to the production of consumer goods which use it as which use the output of the capital goods sector as an intermediate because they embody them and so ISTC not only makes capital cheaper it also makes inputs cheaper so it boosts the contribution a little bit so that's going to widen our bounds a little bit if we um, do growth accounting that way. I'm not going to show you everything because it's redundant. <clears throat> it's, you can just read that paper. It's all there. Um, mm -hmm. So, as I said, there's an extension also where we allow goods, sorry, countries to buy capital goods by selling consumption on some international market, or they might sell resources. We end up with the exact same growth accounting um, equations and contributions. Basically, why? Because balanced trade means that the value of exports equals the value of the imported capital. So if you just measure them in the right units, you end up with the same capital accumulation equation. How much time do I have? Ah! Okay, so I better hurry up. So um, rather than show you that model, I'm just gonna skip it and go straight to the results thing because we're running later than I thought. I guess the only thing that's worth saying is that of course, if this is the price of capital that I face and I import the capital, 
then it depends on what the price of capital was at origin, what my exchange rate is, and what trade costs are. So the import-based model also is useful because it tells you a few other things you might want to look at if you want to account for ISTC differences around the world. We should look at trade costs and uh, maybe even exchange rates, although of course exchange rates should be determined in equilibrium by the balanced trade condition. So if you think about it, really you might think that that's not going to matter and empirically it doesn't. All right. Come on. Holly, wake up. Okay. There. So the data, as Rachel was saying, is from the Penn World's table, it's the latest edition as much as possible. Resource shares are from MSS. Uh, but to measure GQ, we actually use an older version of the pen tables, and there's a very good reason for that that I probably don't have time to talk about. Um, basically, the more recent pen tables have several benchmark years for measuring prices, and a benchmark, in a benchmark year, when you're measuring PPP, you don't just use the price of a good in some, of the goods produced by some sector in one place. You're actually using some average of what they make and what nearby countries make. And you're also not sampling all the goods they make. You're actually um, only looking at goods that, you've, that are, you've, for which you can find comparable things in both countries and so on. So it's not actually measuring the price of capital. It's measuring something else. So we don't use. So we use an older version that doesn't have multiple benchmark years. Because we're not interested in levels of this price anyway. We want growth rates. This thing is running out of batteries. Um, then I said we have a sort of quality adjustment. What we do is um, we have the official numbers for the United States, and we have the Greenwood, Hercules, and Grissel quality adjusted numbers for the United States. And so what we could do is just say, well, we know, suppose we think there's a quality adjustment out there. We don't have the exact measure of quality adjustment for, I don't know, China, Albania, or anywhere else, just for the United States. But if you can find a good proxy for the extent to which you want to adjust the quality adjustment, then we just multiply that by the official measure and get somewhere. And so what we use is indicators of the penetration of information technology. Not because, excuse me, not because we think that that's the only thing underlying quality adjustments, um, but rather we know it's one thing. Of course, IT comes along with a bunch of other kinds of goods that might also be fairly advanced, so the share is telling us about other things. And in addition, when you look in the United States across industries, it turns out, and by industries I mean 63 fairly disaggregated, the rate of ISTC by industry is actually really highly correlated with the IT share capital. So, seems to work there. And so we find that all these measures, the official one, the one, it says servers. The density of secure servers is going to be our IT indicator. So the one that's using an adjustment for quality using servers, and the one that's constructed using the Cummins and Violante quality adjusted specific capital good type measures, weighted by import shares. These three things are very highly correlated. So that's telling us that um, <clears throat> Even if we don't know the exact quality adjustment, the rankings are the same either way. So um, this is a correlation between the import-based measure and the official measure without any adjustments. And you can see these correlations are quite, quite um, large. But the other thing you can see is that the values are quite different. None of, by construction, none of these numbers are less than one. But the other ones, the official ones, are. So that's why this is an indicator of composition. It's not clear it's an indicator of the levels, and so we're not going to use it for all our quantitative exercise. We're just going to use it to help us interpret things. Um, 1.8% per year. That's the gap between, hold on. Sorry, no, that's no, not 1.8%. 1. 1.8% um, is the quality adjusted measure of GQ. The official one is about 0 0.58. Correct. The gap? Oh, um, 1.8 minus 0 0.58 percent. Oh, 
oh, what's the contribution in the United States? I'm sorry. Um, so there's a section of that in the paper, and of course it depends which measure you're using. If you use the quality adjusted measure and you use um, the intermediate based, this then the other, then you can get up to basically 60%. So you can get to the same number. If you use the official values, then it gets much smaller. It's more like 20-ish, which is actually exactly what you get if you look at Holton, who doesn't have quality adjusted stuff, versus G GHK that do. So as far as the United States is concerned, it doesn't actually look that different from what's out there. A little section in the paper on that. So here is the, a histogram of the contributions. I have truncated it at 100. There are a couple that are actually outside 100, actually on this side. Um, which we can talk about in a second, although we have like one minute. So um, you can see there's not, there are not many places that are up here with big contributions. And actually, um, the ones that have big contributions, if we say we call big 30%, are very few. Um, these are places that have fairly high GQ values but very slow, almost all of them have very slow overall growth rate. So their contributions are large, not really because they're, because the STC is boosting them, but more like something else is wrong with these places and they're growing pretty slow, it seems. So it's not clear that it's really a contribution. Then if you average around the world, you get, or at least among the set of countries that we have, which is much of the, most of the world, this is the contribution you get, it's very small. Here's with the IT-based quality adjusted measure, again, there are more places up here, and um, what happens is that, of course, this is giving a boost to countries that use a lot of IT, um, which turns out to mean these guys. Um, but again, most other places don't really get a quality adjustment. Now the global contribution of ISTC to growth is quite a bit larger, though it's still not very big, and of course that's basically because now on this list we have the United States, which is 40% of GDP or something. <clears throat> so these differences are important because um, we work out a few just random examples. And um, if you take a country with the median values of all the parameters and you raise their um, ISTC to the rate in the United States, that country would um, have a growth rate that would lead its GDP to rise by 10% in eight years. Big difference. If you don't do it to the median country, but rather you do it to all the countries in our sample and average by GDP, 12 years. So again, we're not saying that there's some way necessarily to raise the rate of ISTC, but this is a way of getting an idea that these differences are important. And I probably have to wrap up, but as I said at the end, we just look at a couple of um, things like trade cost levels, trade cost changes, and some institutional variables just to get a sense of whether there are any institutional or trade-related correlates to what we're finding, we find the ones that I mentioned in the introduction. So what should we do? Um, try and measure things better, as I think Alessio is going to measure, mention. Maybe we want to, although I have a hard time thinking it's going to make that much difference, but um, it might make a difference to how we interpret what we're finding, that's for sure, if we find anything useful there. Um, some people look, ask us why we're, the, whether a balanced growth path is a useful way of thinking about this because they think there may be trends in resource shares or some other violation of what looks like balanced growth, but we didn't find any, so we decided not to go down the much more complicated road of trying to do things outside a balanced growth path. And of course, we would like to have a model of endogenous ISTC, which Timo is working on. Timo is working on one part of this, which is where the rate of change is endogenously determined by people who are trying to change it. There's this other side of composition, which we discussed a bit yesterday, and so you would need a different model to think about, well, what's affecting endogenously the choice of types of capital goods, what's making you skew one way or the other. And so I have some papers from a long time ago about that, but I think there's definitely more to be done there. So thank you very much. Okay, so um, let me briefly summarize the paper. Um, I think it's a very nice paper because it uh, uh, gives a sense of uh, uh, how much this uh, investment specific technological change is important across countries, okay? Um, so the, the important result is that they find it does not contribute much to growth, but uh, still it's very heterogeneous across countries. So <clears throat> results are pretty robust to this um, 
to these changes. So, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I find the paper pretty interesting. So I want to focus on an issue that um, is not considered in the paper and maybe the, the authors will uh, want to, to address. Um, basically, it's uh, something that I always ask myself about this uh, investment specific technological change. So uh, let's see how these, these guys, Green, Greenwood, Herkowitz and Krasel, measure in the original paper this investment specific technological change. So they take the price deflator for non-durable consumption goods and and services, well, they remove housing. Uh, and they divide it by um, the price of uh, durable equipment, okay? So in this paper, uh, the authors, uh, um, Roberto and Cotter, uh, they focus on the denominator. What I want to do here is to focus on the numerator. So the price of, uh, basically of consumption, okay? So this is a conference on structural transformation. We know that sectors, grow and shrink. So uh, my, my question here is how much of the change in the composition of consumption is uh, responsible for this uh, thing that we call investment specific technological change, okay? So first of all, we know that the relative price of goods over services declines, okay? So this is uh, uh, for the US, relative price of the two types of goods. But uh, what we can do is to uh, split uh, goods into durables and non-durables and see how these prices behave uh, with respect to services. So the, the red one is the previous graph. So it's total goods relative to services. Then the blue line is uh, non-durables. Over. Uh, it's, uh, it's consumption. Price of, uh, so it's price of uh, consumption of goods over price of consumption of services, okay? From, yeah, expenditure side of the yeah, national accounts. So this is, the red line is what I just showed in the previous graph. So blue line is non-durables, price of non-durables over services, and this is price of durables, uh, sorry, non-durables over services and durables over services, okay? So price of non-durables declines much faster than the price of uh, non-durables with respect to services. So. Um, from structural transformation, we know that the share of services in consumption, when you measure consumption as non-durables plus services, which is the definition of uh, Greenwood and co-authors, uh, this share of services is increasing. So by adopting this, uh, this measure of investment-specific technological change, we should take into account that there is structural transformation in consumption, okay? So imagine uh, two distinct worlds in which one in which consumption is only non-durable goods, another in which consumption is only services, okay? And compute investment specific technological change in these two words. Uh, the red one is the word in which consumption is uh, non-durables, the blue one is uh, the one in which uh, consumption is services, okay? So pretty different, look at the magnitude. This from 1950 increases factor of three, this is a factor of six, so very large difference. And uh, this is the relative share of non-durables over services in consumption. So take into account this in your construction of the price of consumption and, sorry. So what you get, this is uh, red and blue is what I just showed. The green one is by accounting for structural transformation. Okay, so of course it's in the middle. So when you look at cross country, investment specific technological change, maybe this factor is important because composition of consumption can be pretty different. Okay, so this in the middle, this grows a factor of 4.56. Okay, so um, yeah, my question here is you consider several factors for this uh, investment specific technological change across countries, you don't consider consumption, but it looks to me that this is pretty important. I mean, could be pretty important, should be pretty important also in the US. So it's not considered in the original paper by Greenwood that quotas, but maybe if you address for consumption composition, this contribution to growth is not so so important as, uh, as they find, okay? So basically this is, uh, um, this is what, I wanted, uh, what I wanted to say. Uh, maybe this is another paper, maybe you can have an extension in this, in this paper, but uh, you know, um, I think it's important to really understand what 
we mean by this uh, technology, investment specific technological change. Maybe it's just structural transformation at play and we have several papers about that. Okay, and uh, yeah, I'm done. So um, um, one question I have is uh, from Jones and others. We see that um, the input output table are very different across these countries. So if I remember correctly, um, it should be in some poor country, it's more like the diagonal is stronger, meaning they don't use very much from other sectors. So in other words, um, the contribution will be smaller. So maybe that could be one kind of um, interpretation or when you do the cross-country distribution of the contribution of uh, ISTC to growth. So that might, you know, because right now you use the same uh, in, uh, intermediate shares or the equipment as an intermediate into other. So I think this might be interesting to look at when you look at cross-country. It shouldn't make much difference to your global um, growth contribution. If anything, it may be your global growth is an upper bound when you take into account of that. Yeah. Any other questions? So Alessio's comments about the composition of durables and services is something we can certainly try and look into. I don't think it's going to change the results because, of course, when we're, we're measuring <coughs> Q and changing Q, I mean, any whether it's changes in composition or differences in prices, it's all in there in the numbers already. So this is useful for trying to um, take apart what's going on there, and we should definitely do that. So I, I appreciate that very much, and, um, and it's absolutely, absolutely correct and pertinent. Um, Rachel's, um, although, yeah, Rachel's comments about um, the I/O tables are true, indeed, right? So the whole point is, if there are no linkages among sectors, right? Imagine the extreme, then intermediates don't matter for your growth accounting exercise, right? If there's strong linkages, then it's going to be different, and if the difference is such that. In the poorer countries, there are fewer apparent linkages, and indeed, it's going to make the contribution of ISTC to them even weaker. Although, maybe um, for the ones where it's negative, it will actually push them. It, what it does is push you closer to zero, whether you're positive or negative. So, it's all added up. I don't know what it would do, but yeah, this is this is something we could um, look into. In some sense. I'm not sure if this is an exact upper bound, but it's in the direction of an upper bound. If, at, at le if nothing else, at least maybe we can try and figure out what's a lower bound. I guess the lower bound is assuming there are no intermediates at all. Kind of do, but we can certainly interpret things in, in that way, and I think that would be much much cleaner. Yes, sir. But I, I don't understand the intermediates. Why intermediates matters in the sense that for you, you know the TFP is on the capital, and you know capital share. So, I mean, it, it, if you were putting some neutral technological progress, it depends on whether we're putting that in the gross output production function or the value added production function. But for you, you're putting it in capital. And so, whether you do write down a gross output function and capital share is smaller in the gross output function, but it filters through all the intermediates, or you just write down a value added function, it seems like they would be the same. Um, so, what happens is that in this mo so, so let's just forget resources. We and let's take let, so um, so things are fairly straightforward. This is this is the general equilibrium growth accounting equation, right, with no intermediates. Um, what happens is that if you have intermediates then um, I guess one way of thinking about it is that a piece of what in the other model you would think is this is actually due to GQ coming in the back through its provision of cheaper intermediates to all the various sectors of the economy to the extent that they use the output of the capital goods industry 
as an intermediate. intermediate. So then um, when you... Lowering your alpha k. Sorry? No, 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 you're not lowering your alpha k. You're, you do, um, what you're doing is you, um, you're lowering your gz, and then gq is um, coming in here again with a different exponent. This part doesn't change because you're adding a different channel. So when you take gq, sorry, when you set this to one, it's disappearing from here and it's also, again, one's way of thinking about it, it's, it's part of what normally you would have thought of as being neutral technical progress. So it That's makes it smaller. Output. Mm, I guess I can just refer you to the paper. <laughs> Not this one, that one. The one, the one, the 2009.